Thank you, Sue. The Central Road. It is a truth, isn't it? It's not where we belong. And that's kind of what we have been seeing as we've been going through the Gospel of John uh, here in 2018. Looking at uh, the one who comes into the world, and as we'll see even in this passage, the reference that uh, this is not uh, where he belongs, and neither is it where we belong. Well, we have been going through the Gospel of John a couple of weeks ago. We were at the tomb of Lazarus, and uh, where Christ raises his friend from the dead, and we entered into the, uh, the, the scene on that Monday Thursday night as uh, Peter uh, was tempted and denied his Lord three times. And our passage today <coughs> takes us into that early Friday morning where Jesus has gone through the initial arrest and trial of the Jewish Sanhedrin, and they have brought him now before the judicial magistrate of the land. So we pick up our scripture passage in John chapter 18, beginning in verse 28. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas, the high priest, to the palace of the Roman governor. Now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If you were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourself and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. And this took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? <coughs> Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. So you are a king then said Pilate. And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate answered. This is the word of the Lord for us this day. Thanks be to God. Lord, as we come to this passage, we seek your truth and ask that you would speak to us as our hearts are grieved at what will transpire for our Lord. Show us the mercy that is hidden in these texts. Give us the hope that comes only from you, so that we might know the joy that you have come to give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pontius Pilate. You know, if there was a list of the most notorious, nasty, wicked, evil people Throughout history, this guy would have special mention. The Roman procurator of Judea from AD 26 to 36. It was his job to enforce the 
Pax Romana, the so-called Roman peace, and he did so in a way that was effective, efficient, and particularly brutal. Pilate, or I'm sorry, Philo, the first century historian, writes about Pilate that he had a vindictiveness and a furious temper, that he was naturally inflexible, a blend of self-will and relentlessness. He goes on to describe this governance, saying his corruption, his acts of insolence, his habit of insulting people, his cruelty and continual murders of people untried and condemned are examples of his never-ending and gratuitous, grievous inhumanity. In other words, this was a bad, bad dude. And here's Jesus standing in front of him to be judged by this man. You know, our passage presents such a high drama of what's, what's going on in this. You have the, the religious leaders who Jesus has antagonized and engaged in, in debate and battle with over his three-year ministry. They've finally gotten the upper hand. They've found him in the dead of night. They've arrested him, brought him to a, a religious council. In an unjust trial, they passed an unjust sentence, and they dragged him over to Pilate, the ultimate arbiter of justice in the, the land. And then begins another level of schemes and manipulation as these Jewish authorities, this Jewish group of uh, power players in Jerusalem, hits off against this Roman procurator, this person who's been installed as authority. And you get the... The, the little jabs, the uh, innuendos, uh, the, the subtle and not so subtle attempts at manipulation. It's a contest of wills between the governor and most of the established leaders uh, in the land. And they are not on the same page. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like Springfield? Does that sound like our nation? And so you see this manipulation that is going on, and, and it's a contest that Pilate will ultimately lose, and characteristically for how Pilate acts, he loses badly, in a bad temper. But standing there before him, in the cool air of a spring morning, during Passover week, <coughs> is a figure who has fascinated the countryside for three years. Jesus would have operated below Pilate's radar level, but he had sufficiently antagonized enough people that this escalation, this confrontation, Jesus standing before Pilate was a foregone conclusion. It would have to end this way. And of course, for the religious elite, this was their way of getting rid of this troublesome figure without having the blame fixed to him. For it is Pilate who will crucify Jesus. These leaders will get off free. And of course, this is a capital case. There is a life on the line. And so Pilate is the judge and the jury who will decide this one's fate. Do you notice the irony that is here? The irony in this passage, you have the Roman pretender seated on the judgment seat, holding in his hands the power to decide life and death, and standing before this venomous snake is the Lamb of God himself. The sinless one whose hands had formed the world, 
who shaped even this petty, cruel, and calculating man in his mother's womb, who formed him before shedding the robes of eternity and entering into this mortal sphere. The one who had been given authority over all creation now stands judgment by one of his creatures. The judge was judged. Renowned theologian Karl Barth writes what I consider just a brilliant essay with this title in the fourth volume of his church dogmatics. He's describing in this about how Christ is our advocate, how Christ is for us, and he submits a number of propositions which he then unpacks in length. And two of those propositions that demonstrate how Jesus is able to save us, I want to unpack a little bit with you today. Bart tells us that Jesus is our advocate, Jesus is for us, in that he took our place as the judge. And secondly, that Jesus is for us in that he took our place as the one who is judged. Jesus took our place as judge and judge. You see, for Karl Barth, the core of our fallen human condition is that we as humanity have usurped God's rightful role as the authority and the judge over creation. He puts it this way, it is our basic sin to take the place of the judge, to try to judge ourselves and others. All other sins, both small and great, derive ultimately from this source. Because it's in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve are tempted and they fall by doing what? By taking that fruit, the fruit from where? From the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They take that fruit and that gives them the ability to discern good from evil. And who is it that is supposed to discern good from evil? It is the judge. So by taking that fruit, Adam and Eve placed themselves in that judgment seat, removing God. From that position. And the implications for that have rippled down throughout history, leading to where we find ourselves today. You know, everyone today finds themselves in this place of judge. We judge everyone else, we judge how they drive, we judge how they look. We judge what they say, we judge what they do, we judge, perhaps most harshly, we judge ourselves. And we have somehow made the self to become that ultimate authority over all things. For Bart, the essence of the fall, the breaking of the relationship with God, is when we take that upon ourselves. When we decide what is right, rather than letting God decide what is right for us. And Christmas, Christmas is that celebration that we have when we again announce that the one who we supplanted has come back to then reclaim his position, his rightful position, to take back what was his from the beginning in grace to become judge so that we don't have to do that anymore. We can live in grace because he has come to retake what is his. And that's what makes this, this dialogue, this interchange between Jesus and Pilate so interesting. You know, if only Pilate had known the grace that Christ offers, if only Pilate could get that Christ had come to say, let me take this position of judgment from you. Let me remove this burden. Let me judge with righteousness and grace. 
But Pilate is too blind to see. I wonder if that blindness filters down to us as well. We find ourselves in a place where we are too blind to see what Christ offers for us. But I think the truth is that there is a little bit of pilot in each one of us. We want to hold on to that authority that we have. We want to hold on to that position that we are in. But the truth is that there is no freedom in being the judge. There is only burden and responsibility. And Christ offers us the chance to be relieved of that burden. Give back the role to the one who truly merits it. To the role that belongs to him, the role of the judge. Christ came on our behalf to free us and to be the judge. But if there's a judge, then there is also a judged. And perhaps we don't want to give up our role of judge because we know if we do, we will be the judge. And that is the case. But Christ intercedes even there as well, taking our place not only as judge, but also our place as the one upon whom judgment falls. The second song that we sang today begins with these great words that come out of 2 Corinthians 5, where God made him who had no sin to become sin for us. Why? So that in him we could become the righteousness of God. That's what's going on in this passage. That's what's going on throughout this entire passion narrative in the Gospels. Where Jesus chooses to allow himself to be judged not just by the Jews, not just by Pilate, but by all of humanity. Judge me. He says. And the payment for that penalty, for that usurpation of the place that belongs to God, has fallen due. The penalty of rebellion at hand, and the one who should have handed down judgment for us chose to receive that upon himself instead. There's a great story about Fiorello LaGuardia. He was the mayor of New York City during the Great Depression and, and World War II. New Yorkers called him the Little Flower because he was this short guy, about five foot four, and he always had a bright carnation in his vest. He was a colorful character. He liked to ride the New York City fire trucks. He'd raid the speakeasies with the police department. He'd take orphanages to baseball games. And when the New York newspapers went on strike, he would get on the radio and read the Sunday funnies to the kids. One bitterly cold night, January 1935, the mayor turned out at a night court serving the forest ward in the city. LaGuardia dismissed the judge who was on the bench that night and took over himself, donning the judicial robes. The first case that came before him was of a tattered old woman that had been brought with the charge of theft, for she had stolen bread. She told LaGuardia that her daughter's husband had deserted her as so many had during that horrible time. Her daughter was sick, her two granddaughters starving. But the plaintiff was there that night, the shopkeeper spoke up, Your Honor, it's a bad neighborhood. 
She's got to be punished to teach other people around here a lesson. And LaGuardia sighed. He looked at the woman and he said, I have to punish you. The law makes no exceptions. Ten dollars or ten days in jail. The woman could not pay. Ten dollars seemed so small to us and so big back then. But the sentence had been pronounced. She wondered what was she going to do. But as LaGuardia banged down the gavel, he stood, took off those judicial robes, walked around the bench and down to the place where the condemned woman stood. And he took out his own wallet and his own ten dollars and gave it to the bailiff saying, her sentence is remitted with me. But he wasn't done yet. He turned around and looked at that courtyard that was, a, that was astonished, that courthouse was astonished, and said, I'm going to now find each and every one of you sitting here, 50 cents each, for living in a town where a person has to steal bread so that her grandchildren can eat. Mr. Bailiff, take my money and collect the fines from everyone here. So the following day, the New York City newspapers reported that $47.50 had been turned over to a bewildered old lady who had stolen a loaf of bread to feed her starving children. <clears throat> 50 cents coming from that red-faced shopkeeper. And the rest from some 70 petty criminals people with traffic violations, New York City policemen who would all pay 50 cents for the privilege of standing there that night and seeing grace at work and giving an ovation, a standing ovation to their mayor. See, this is what Christ does on the cross. He removes us from the role of judge that oppressive role that we're not able to fulfill. And then when we find ourselves in the dark with our guilt plainly written before us, unable to deny, unable to hide, with lawful sentence passed, the judge steps down from that high place. He takes off those judicial robes and he takes our place in the dark to receive the sentence due for us. The righteous judge takes the righteous judgment out of his love for you and for me. He allows himself to be judged by the epitome of the callous and rebellious humanity. And as Pontius Pilate passes sentence on Jesus of Nazareth, a sentence due for Pilate and for you and for me, the judgment of rebellion against the very nature of this world that God had set in motion, the judgment of those who had marred creation that God had pronounced good, so very good, back in Genesis. The judgment that was once passed upon the world in the flood, which God said, I will never, ever do again. Our Lord took that judgment upon himself to satisfy the wrong and make reconciliation possible. The judge judged for us. You know, there's many characterizations about what truly happened that Thursday night and Friday morning 2,000 years ago. Scholars, artists, pastors, directors have come up with many reasons for the death on the cross of the most human individual in our history. Jesus has been painted as revolutionary, victim, martyr, fool, Good man, crushed in the wheels of human oppression. But none of these things accurately reflect the truth described in Scripture. For he was no victim. 
He was no martyr. Not simply a good man in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was exactly in the right place at the right time to take all of the brokenness that we have endured between us and God from the beginning to make it right again. It was for this reason that he taught the crowd to work the miracles. Everything was built to this pivotal moment, and as Pilate passes sentence, then Christ takes up the cross, the burden of guilt which every human through history has to bear before God, was taken up by him. So that we can stand like that old woman in that night courtroom, in shock, amazed that our sentence has been remitted. And instead of penalty, we are given gift of grace and of life. So as we look on this cross during this Lenten season, and we see it not as an instrument of torment or of horror, but as a symbol of grace, where it announces that our debt has been paid in full, our punishment remitted to the one who is for us in all things.